Mulweni, good morning. Kuimura, Sanbonani, Dumelang. I am going to, I would like to welcome you all to the first um, of the first part of a three part conversation um, organized by the French Institute of South Africa. Um, entitled Living as a Poet. And in this conversation, what we are trying to do is to try and get a holistic um, overview or get some, a holistic insight into how one can actually make a living as a poet. Um, and so we have a series of um, really interesting guests that I will be talking to over the next three days. And um, the first person we are talking to is um, the formidable force that is Malika and Lovo, whose words and productions have appeared on pages and stages across South Africa, in Austria, Uganda, South Africa, the USA, the UK, Holland, Ireland, Germany, Spain, Yo many, many countries. As a poet, playwright, performer, and arts administrator, Malika's contribution to South African art and culture via writing groups, numerous workshops, festivals, and mentorship spans over 20 years since 2007. She was the project manager and guest curator and presenter of Africa's Centers Africa Center's Badalisha Poetry Exchange, um, later known as badalishapoetry.com. Um, the first ever in Africa, which focused on poetry podcasting. As the founder, member of the Cape Town-based women's collective Weave, which was from 1998 to 2004. She's also co-edited Weave Links at Boiling Point, a selection of 21 of 21st century Black women's writing from the southern tip of Africa. In 2004, she indicated she initiated uh, and the world was woman ensemble. Her poetry collections include Burn in Africa, published in 19, 1999, Womb of the World, A Labor of Love, 2001, Truth is But Spirit and Flesh, 2008, Invis Invisible Earthquakes, A Woman Journal Through Stillbirth, um, 2009, Close, in 2017, and her published plays are A Colored Place, 1998, Sister, and Sister Briani, 2010. She lectures prominently, um, she, she features prominently in Our Words, Our Worlds, writing on Black South African women poets, 2000, 2000 to 2018. And it's actually, I would like to, before I, I, I say hello to Sis Mandika, I would like, to read something that I think was really incredible. So um, Sis Malika has produced um, five poetry collections of her own. In the five collections, um, she has created 219 poetry experiences, poetry events. If we are to look at poet, poems as individual ex experiences, um, and so Makosa Zana writes, um, she has continued to be prolific during the first part of the 21st century, taking Kala's definition of poetry to its logical conclusion demonstrates that in 18 years, Lovu's acts as a poet created a total of 219 events in literary history, averaging 12 poems per year thus offering readers the same number of experiences. This example does not include her 22 poetic narratives and the poem extract, but it does give an example of the further quantification and prolifer pro proliferation of an individual poet. Um, if I am to say that I am deeply, deeply honored to be speaking to Malika Antlovo, um, it is not an understatement. So um, I would like to welcome um, Sis Malika. Thank you for joining us. Oh, sister, thank you for, as Dinam Klope taught me, it's like laying down the carpet for whatever comes next. 
because we can plan as much as we like, but this conversation mm -hmm. has um, a richness and a depth that uh, I know will, will be shared with everyone in the group and your presence, everyone who's here, thank you for showing up. <laughs> um, before we begin, um, and we talk about kind of making a living as a poet um, and balancing the, 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 the very difficult thing of, you know, paying bills and writing with integrity. Um, I would like to remind everyone who is joining us from wherever you are joining us from um, to please submit your questions. If you have any questions for Sis Malika, um, you can send them through via Facebook, via YouTube, Twitter, um, and you can also, if you are here in the webinar, um, of course, please feel free to use the chat. Um, but yes, so you, in 1999, you, you, your first, you launched your first kind of, um, um, release of, of Born in Africa at Poetry Africa. Um, <laughs> alongside um, the likes of Linton Kwesi Johnson. So this is kind of a full circle moment. Tell us a bit about your journey and like how you, how you became Malika Ndlovo. Sure. Um, I was thinking about the little girl. Um, and also I think um, the, the topic, I love the fact that this theme is not called making a living as a poet, but living as a poet, because this word living, I think is the heart of my understanding of what it is to be a poet in my own experience, but what I witnessed with so many others. Mm -hmm. um, and that is that this is my life. It's not my job. Um, I have always experienced a sense of translating my life experience through poetry from as young as you know, as five or six years old, I was making up my own rhymes and forcing my family to listen to them. <laughs> um, and I, I always, and in my mind, that was partly about language because I wasn't exactly writing and crafting at that age, but I was storytelling. Mm -hmm. And I was making this through sound and sometimes through, you know, my performative self dancing or acting it out. Um, taking on persona and for me poetry is still essentially all of those things you know it's a bit um, generic to say everything in life is poetry uh, but some part of me still believes that mm -hmm. um, and also that it's linked to the word life in that I really feel as though poetry is a is um, has been my my well a place where I go for my wellness where I have been sustained throughout my life as a person, as a human being, mm -hmm. at a really central and core personal place, an intimate place. Um, and it has also then birthed things that I can share with the bigger world and, and grow things, you know, mm -hmm. in collaboration or as a professional career. So I really like this idea of, of the living as a poet, because also when you conjure up the word life, you conjure up its shadow naturally, which is mm -hmm. dying. <laughs> mm -hmm. What the so-called struggle, you know, and the death, the many shedding of skin. So um, I started writing when I was really young. I have a father who's a pretty good storyteller. Both my parents love books. Um, my mother is a nonstop show. <laughs> I've written a tribute poem about her. Um, saying that she's like a 24-7 radio, talk radio station, mm -hmm. right? This is my mom. So I'm a diluted version of her. <laughs> and um, I think there was always musicality in my family as well. Um, I started really young. My first poem was published when I was 10 in a school magazine, and it was about dreading um, going to the dentist. But throughout my, my life, I feel like, I never really understood that this would become the foreground of my practice. It was something I did like breathing. I always was journaling and writing poems and coming up with stories. But I only started to really share this when I was frustrated in an apartheid school system in about grade seven, where I knew others were having access to, um, you know, uh, drama, for example, theater as a, as a subject. And I was stuck in this township school that only had English and only wanted me to regurgitate this colonial diet. 
and there was no place other than in the comfort or the assurance of um, educators who said, I see you, I think you must pursue this. So what is it mm. that we're gonna do to help you get to that next place? And then I moved to another school on a bursary where I was in the first multiracial so-called context in which I really got to drink in other people, you know, poetry from everywhere mm. um, in Durban and started to really share my own voice um, at a very turbulent stage of my adolescence where it was, you know, pretty much uh, life-saving to write. Hmm. Um, I, can, I, I, I can definitely relate to the life-saving to write. Um, and it's interesting because, I mean, I, I, I love this idea of, I'm not this idea, this fact of not being able to kind of separate life from poetry and how poetry then becomes such an integral part of who you are and um, the living experience. Um, you studied something completely different um you studied arts management actually and you were you you were good in accounting um <laughs> like i mean i'm just trying. but like again, talk to us a bit about talk to us talk, talk to us a bit about um balancing that the, like as in because you're a mother you're um you're also uh like i mean you're a living woman who has to then uh, pay the bills but also you want to write and you want to write things that you can be proud of and things that, that, um, that give meaning. I mean, well, that, that, that feed you and that feel true to you. Um, but when, you, when, you're, when you're creating on demand, that's not necessarily an easy thing to do. So no. just talk to us a bit about that and how, that, how, how you kind of transitioned different roles and um, different identities within the poetry um, landscape to, to juggle? Sure. Um, I think I'll, I'll just backtrack a little to say that I started out wanting to be an actress. So I got into theater and I, and I got a performing arts diploma or degree at DUT and came out of there having studied you know, for, for three years and I felt as though I graduated with one wing because I had no business acumen. I was you know, mediocre in terms of my own self-organization in terms of admin, but I very bravely thought I was going to start this independent woman's uh, theater production company. And I was clueless. I didn't know how to balance a budget. I didn't know how to do strategic planning. I had my very, I want to say airy or, you know, ethereal ideas about how I could market what I was doing. So I really needed that other wing. <laughs> I crashed a couple of times in that first year of graduating from theater because I was so confident in the product, but I had no way of lobbying for the value of it, knowing how to translate for it, how to schedule a timeline that was feasible for the production and to take into account the variables of the fact that you're not gonna knock on one door and have everything come through, right? So it, you have to have a time frame in which this precious gift that you want to offer, this dream um, can be held while you do put on the other hat, I want to say. It, it literally is another side of your brain. <laughs> um, in order to, to understand how you need to, I felt like it was a translation exercise, having to talk to a funder or a theater manager about why mm. this was the, the product that would bring bums onto seats. Um, and sometimes, yes, that was very painful because it felt like a kind of um, removal from the essence of what it is that I was doing as a, as a poet, but also, or a creative. Um, but I, I, I really grew some muscles after the qualification a year later in arts administration, which I'm so grateful for pioneers like Gitanjali Patha, who founded the first South African Women Arts Festival at the Playhouse Company in Durban and moved on to Joburg. An absolute iconic figure for me in terms of recognizing and investing in making sure that artists know how to take care of themselves in that way. Mm -hmm. And she lived it, but I also literally got qualified thanks to people like her who made those courses happen mm. um, with corporate funding. And it is a juggling act. It is still 30 years later, a constant 
engagement with the part of me that just wants to do what I'm born to do. And mm-hmm. it is not making budgets <laughs> mm-hmm. and it is not translating, you know, uh, the soul of it for somebody who wants, a, you know, something shiny and kind of Afro chic on their stage. So what what have you done? Like, I mean, I know that you you you've written plays, you've um, published books. Um, you talk a bit. Um, you talk a lot about um, alternative economies and and doing a creative audit. If you were to kind of share with us your creative audit, um, so that so that also young poets at home can also start thinking about how to how to reimagine themselves um, as poets with other skills, as poets with like able to to look at different avenues. Sure. So I, I, I may have said this to you even before, I really, you know, as ambivalent as I was in the beginning, I think that understanding how the administration or professional management of your own craft and your art um, is actually like this skeleton that fundamentally supports all the other manifestations of your creative self. It is that central. It is important to understand the ABCs of how you A, can protect your copyright, your content. You do need to, there's many ways you can do that. You can Google that if you have to, but there are others who are doing it in your community or poets that you admire that you could ask for and workshops, et cetera. But I think it's really fundamental to understand your, the value of what it is that you do and how um, the basic nuts and bolts, because that's also what makes funders mm-hmm. take you seriously. If you sound like you don't know how to manage a budget or if you underquote what it is that you are bringing or if you don't recognize that there are logistical costs involved in pricing mm-hmm. what it is that you do. It's not only those five minutes on stage, it's the entire A, you know, caliber of your work over a period of time. You're not green at this or straight out of, it's not your first poem. So there's a craft value that you need to acknowledge. Um, For some that's about status and celebrity, you know, uh, currency. I'm not talking about that as much because not everybody's going to find that level of exposure. What I mean is to, to protect this gift that you have by understanding those principles of arts management and administration. Um, Also diversifying your product if you have to talk about marketing. Mm. You know, I don't like to think of my work as a product, but I sure do need to make sure that it is being called by its real name. Mm. So I need to have a say about how what I'm producing is languaged. Mm. So, and, and to build the confidence to be able to say, thank you for, I'd like to see whatever you're going to say about my work in that article or in that poster, because I I want it to be a true representation of what I mean. um, Not that you just do your thing and then hand it over with the price tag to to someone who's going to make an event. So there are multiple layers to this conversation that I think is an internal education or um, re-education from what you may have perceived before as well as going out there and finding out how do I do this? Because I have that feeling that I'm I'm underpaying myself or I'm feeling a bit vulnerable, like these people are taking my stuff and running off with it. Or it doesn't sound like me. um, I do wanna encourage people to to ask questions um, and send them through. Um, but I also, so tomorrow when we're speaking, we'll, we'll be speaking to Vangela Makwakwa um, precisely about that, like as in the, the, like drawing up invoices, quantifying, um, you know, really making sure that you can, you can, um, you can um, get like, think about the monetary value of your work. Um, sure. But I love I love what you're and and then on on Thursday we'll be speaking with Sarah Godsell as part of Imbepo Press to to make sure that people get an idea of the copyrights and the um, the really taking care of your work the the, the physical the product publication of, yeah. The, yeah of publishing um, but I also would like to, like as in you you make this beautiful point about um, not everybody's going to get the the level of exposure that's going to allow them to be able to. Um, you know, necessarily travel the world or um, 
you know, make the, the, the thousands and thousands um, per gig. So what, I mean, if, if you were talking to your younger self here um, in 2020, trying to, to, to kind of figure yourself out as, as, a, as a baby poet, what would you say, like, you know? Um, most definitely, I would say, start at the root of why you do what you do recognize that your unique identity and gift, your natural way of expressing yourself, your identity is part of the value that makes you stand out amidst mm -hmm. lots of poets or in the landscape of, of the arts or literature. Um, I also, and, and in doing that, you are able to, to really, um, articulate what or navigate when you're feeling that you're in a space where um, it's so important for you to, to stand up for yourself. So, you know, to, to, I think that takes time and it takes saying no sometimes even to um, contracts in which you are being undervalued mm -hmm. and knowing that you may lose the job. And in some ways that is probably worth doing rather than saying yes, if you can to you know to sustain that internal confidence and valuing of yourself and setting a precedent for how you want to grow from there i was saying I mean, a bit earlier about diversifying your product um i i have expressed my poetry to mul through multiple media it's been in print i've performed it as theatrical production um it's been uh as podcast um it's been in facilitating other people's creative development. So that thing of looking at how this core um, treasure or resource of your poetry can be channeled through multimodal forms or multiple platforms in order to generate different streams of income is really important. If I was just sitting quietly and writing and trying to get published, I definitely wouldn't be able to make a living. Mm. But as an applied artist, I can be in a hospital one day, in a school another, at someone's wedding on another day, or traveling to a festival. And all of these are working with different scales of currency and costing. And all of them are also, also dipping into that well I was talking about to draw different aspects of, of this work. Um, so um, just to, because this ties into exactly what you're saying, Tando Luetu Gulwa is asking um, in terms of diversifying, yes. um, in terms of di diversifying one's craft, um, performance-wise though, how would, you, how would um, you advise one to build the confidence to transition from a written poet to a spoken word poet? Um, and I think that's a really good question because not everybody who writes can perform and not everybody who performs <laughs> writes well. <laughs> I think that's also really important to recognize that we are in a time where it's almost assumed that performance um, is what we mean when we're talking about poetry. Um, I think that, you know, in terms of the way that that particular version of your work gets amplified, it's really important what you're saying about if, uh, as I said, when you go inward before you go outward, Yes, it's lovely to have public speaking or performance skills so that you're, you're not completely silenced in front of an audience, whether you're reciting or reading. Um, but it is also important that you, if you see somebody, it's basically like learning from your community. Mm. If you see somebody that you, that you love, you know, you love the work of somebody out there who's doing it in a way that deeply resonates, it feels like you, not you trying to be them, no you finding that person is languaging and you know, expressing in a way that I recognize is a part of me mm. because, and so what can I learn from them? Is there some way that I can either learn from what they're doing, try it out in private or with friends I trust, um, or is there a workshop happening? Who knows where I could go and learn about performance skills. Mm. But if that isn't what you're doing, don't push yourself to go there. In another way that is selling yourself out, if you are a poet, and I don't like this binary of page versus stage poet, 
you will know where in the spectrum or on any given day or platform, you feel this is how you want to express yourself on your journey or in relation to the content you're doing. Mm. So it's not appropriate for me to always be performing similar for you. Yeah. And, you know, so um, I, I know that we're, we're running out of time and it's, it's such a shame because this is like such a, I mean, there's so much to share and there's so many questions to ask, but um, we have one more question. Um, I think maybe if we can like try and quickly squeeze that in. Um, sure. Ntabi Sisitole says, how does one, um, oh, we have two more questions. How Behind does one, spaces. yeah, um, go about diversifying in the space, um, Diversify, diversifying the spaces in which their work appears, i.e. spaces do not necessarily always have to be a stage. And then also, uh, Masejo um, Piti is asking how important it is for one to have a professional qualification that is in alignment with the craft of poetry. Because um, she's the BCom accounting graduate with zero correlation to poetry. And I think that's a really sure. good question. Sure. So let me start with the last one first. Um, I don't, there are many poets who are very successful in the world who have and you know qualifications that have nothing to do with literature. I don't have a literary degree. I didn't do an MA in creative writing. And so I'm not dismissing the value of doing those things. In fact, over time, I've certainly yearned or even been jealous that I haven't had the luxury of exclusively focusing on the craft that and, and the levels of um, digesting other work that comes with an academic way of entering into this field. Mm -hmm. um, but I think the first thing is write, Bala. You really need to have a constant practice of writing and the amount of work that you produce when you're listening to how you could improve it. The body of the growing body of that work is where I think the soil of growing into uh, your craft of poetry comes from. And as I said, learning from others, finding out where you can refine what it is that you're doing. In terms of spaces, I'm, I'm racing through this. Obviously, this mm. is a, it's a big subject. Um, I, you know, for me, this is, I said earlier, it's about passion. If your heart's not in something, even when you go up on stage, I'm not going to feel you. <laughs> there has to be an, integ an integrous connection with your sense of purpose of why are you writing poetry? To get to make friends, to be social, to to win an award. What what is? I think that if you are sincerely connected. So, for example, I'm particularly passionate about healing and about how even on a clinical, biological level, creative expression heals you, as in disease or illness. Mm -hmm. So, I'm very engaged with people who work with psycho-emotional issues, with clinical art therapy. I'm sometimes in medical faculties doing poetry with people in medical anthropology or in maternal health, sciences. Mm -hmm. And as you mentioned, even you know, accounting for me is about patterns and constellations of numbers. I think of it creatively. We are not either or. Mm -hmm. All of these potentials are within our capacity. So if you're interested, I'm interested in finding out, for example, you know, if you're into engineering or accounting, what is it conceptually, metaphorically, um, that, that draws you to that particular field of interest and see how you could translate some of that in using the vocabulary of poetry. Mm. It's such an exciting and inspiring, but also unique ingredient. So, you know, the accountant poet, the poet accountant or engineer. Yes, please. Mm. I mean, Nosipo Gumede is also, I think, an engineer and a fabulous poet. Mm. <laughs> it's true. And... I mean, I think that's that's really true. Like we we have to also. That's why this is called living as a poet, um, mm -hmm. because you have to be able to bring your full self to your writing, to your poetry, Absolutely. to um, to the work that you do, and allow that to to like as in to guide how you navigate the space. Um, so I think um, unfortunately that's all we have time for today. Um, but I really like as in Kamako, 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 thank you so much for, for um, bringing yourself to us and being so generous. 
um, and we really, really appreciate it. Um, I would like to encourage everyone to join us again tomorrow at 11 a.m. where we will be talking to Vangila Makwakwa, um, a financial expert, and she talks about kind of um, financial health, like as in um, a holistic approach to financial health. Um, so we, we're looking forward to that conversation. And if you wanna register for the webinar, go to the Poetry Africa website, um, make sure that you bring all your questions and we'll see you tomorrow. Um, this is obviously brought to us by the French Institute and we thank Poetry Africa for providing the space so that we can make sure that um, we're growing each other as poets. Thank you, Sis Frankie. Thank you.